everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Lizzie, and I'm just so incredibly honored to help lead you guys in worship this week. Uh, but if I were to be completely transparent, I actually struggled quite a bit with anxiety and unrest this past week. Uh, just thinking about the current situation that we're in, the rising numbers of cases in California and the economy and whether there will be an economy in a couple of years when I need a job, um, just really made me feel like everything was up in the air. Um, but as I was feeling all these feelings of unrest and uneasiness, I felt truly compelled to press deeper into who God is um, and to cling to his promises. And I realized just how much God has already put in the work for us and that he has already prepared the way and that all we have to do is follow him to lay down all of the things that distract us, lay down all the things that make us comfortable and just push deeper and deeper into who he is. Um, because if we don't have Jesus, we don't have anything. Um, and so I pray that for you this week, um, and also through this worship, you can find this time to lay down your burdens, lay down your struggles, and press deeper into who God is, and press deeper into his promises. Because at the end of the day, during this incredible time of waiting, you know, God is working. Uh, so let us pray, and then, you know, let's move on with worship. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this time where we can just gather in your name and gather in your spirit, God, regardless of where we are physically. Heavenly Father, we you have shown time and time again that you transcend walls, you transcend nations, you transcend countries, God. And now is no different, Lord. So I pray that you move in every single one of us individually, open up our hearts and our minds so that we can truly be open to the message you want to spread to us this week, God. Lord, let this be a time of you and nothing but you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Everything you said to me You could take me through the fire You can ignite the flame inside of me I'm on the road, let's travel I'm on my way, way to your heart, Lord You know I have seen You will show me, show me your heart Lord, show me your heart No. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you make the darkness tremble. And we thank you so much that you are so powerful that you are able, just your name can move mountains, God. So Heavenly Father, I pray that as we go into this time of learning more about you, um, may all the things that prevent us from truly knowing you leave in Jesus' name because they do not belong here, God. Heavenly Father, I pray for Pastor Josh as he relays your message. I pray that you guide um, his his mouth, give him the words to speak, God. Um, and Lord, I pray that you just continue to prepare our hearts so that we can be open to what you have to say to us this week, so that we can apply it to our lives and continue on this path of righteousness with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hi everyone, welcome to Saturday Night Worship. My name is Katie, I'll be your host today. Uh, we're actually gonna go into our time of a breakout room so we can say hi to each other, catch each other up on the uh, on our week as well as share about our challenge that we had last week which was to um, text someone or share with someone your favorite photo with them. Uh, it just gave us an opportunity to uh, say hi and have a meaningful and, and intentional conversation with our our friends or family or whoever you decided to uh, to reach out to. Uh, so if you are on YouTube, uh, just sit tight for a few minutes. We're going to, um, or you can join us on Zoom, uh, but we are going to uh, go into time breakout rooms now. So uh, go ahead and click the link and we'll see you soon. Uh, let's see, we'll just wait and hear back and hopefully everyone will come back soon. I think we're almost all here. So let's go on and move on to our time of tithing and offering. So um, something that I was praying about for tithing and offering is that God really loves a cheerful giver. And it really brought me back to um, the story of the woman that, um, that came and she was just so remorseful. She came and sat at the feet of Jesus and she used her hair and some really expensive perfume and just sat at the feet of Jesus, cried, used her tears and, and, um, and cleaned his feet. And um, that beautiful picture of um, just giving God as much as she could in her state of vulnerability, in her state of appreciating who Jesus was, um, and just exalting him to a place where she was completely humble and, and even broken. And, and she gave God everything and um, her tears and her perfume and all that she had. Um, that's what Jesus was, was pleased. Um, and I think that, you know, we can kind of take that lesson. And if we think about our tithing and offering, you know, God really wants what's from our heart. And he wants our first fruits. And so when we are giving, let's give generously. Let's really understand who Jesus is and all that he's done for us and be able to give from our first fruits. And you can do so on cbc.net or church center app. Um, moving on to our next uh announcement. So next week we are having communion. So as we partake together, let's prepare our elements this week, or if you have to go to the store, buy some grape juice. Um, if you're on a special diet, go ahead and grab your, your special things that uh, you'll need to break bread so that we can remember our Lord together. So that's next week. Okay. Moving on, we have our CEBC Without Walls Challenge. For those of you that are just joining us, uh, we are having a uh, our campaign, CEBC Without Walls. It's our opportunity to really uh, just 
try to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ when we can't meet in person at church. And so we still want to be the church. We're still called to live Christian lives with Christian values, with kingdom values. And uh, our CEBC Without Walls Challenge is just uh, a part of that. So every single week we have a different challenge to really um, make you think, to be able to maybe give you something to tangibly do so that you can still be the hands and feet of Jesus without meeting in person. And so this week, our challenge is share or post your go-to Bible verse for hope or comfort, uh, especially during these times when um, quarantine numbers are, or quarantine, quarantine is difficult, right? COVID numbers are rising. Our futures are kind of in jeopardy and we just don't really know what's going on, right? Then um, I, I truly believe that scripture and, and the Bible have, or one the same, but scripture in the Bible uh, have such words of comfort and things to um, cling on to and hold on to so that you can really look to God and find hope and that you can place your faith in him. And so your challenge this week is to share or post your go-to Bible verse for hope or comfort. All righty. And then moving on. Uh, so I am super excited for this. I have yet to sign up, but I'm going to sign up today. Uh, we are doing a, we're partnering with a bunch of different churches. There's a conference going on. It's a woman simulcast conference. Uh, if you want to sign up, there is a, I believe it's $20. You can uh, sign up with Margaret Lee uh, and she will um, hook you up with your entrance and your code that you'll need. So it's online. And for those of you that are worried, like, oh, I can't make the I can't make the times. You'll actually have access to the content for, I believe, 20 days. And so you'll have it for about three weeks for you to um, listen to um, the incredible stories and inspirations and be able to meditate on that for three weeks afterwards. And I really hope that could be a blessing for um, us women. So uh, sign up today. It starts August 8th, so next week. So go ahead, contact Margaret. And I think we have a little uh, intro video for you to check out our conference. So this just in, I actually just got corrected. Uh, it's not 20 days you'll have access to the content. You'll have it for 60, which is even better. So woo, uh, that's awesome. Um, you can also sign up um, at cebc.net slash events. Um, and by the way, if you miss any of these announcements, if I'm talking too fast or it just doesn't make sense to you, you can visit our website at cebc.net. You can get informed. Uh, you can also download our church center app to see what's going on as well. We'll have announcements. We'll have our latest um, updates as well. And if you want to get involved, um, you can find all these different resources at cebc.net. All right. So that's all for me today. Um, it is such an honor to worship with you. I'm going to hand it off to Pastor Josh. Hi, everybody. Just welcome to our Saturday worship. My name is Pastor Josh. Let's begin with prayer. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that we can come and just be rejuvenated by your spirit, Lord. Um, not just about who you are, but to learn about our um, our place in this world, um, who we are in you, Lord, our identity as children of you, as ambassadors of you in your kingdom, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you will just speak to us tonight, um, that you will take away any distractions that we may have around us or in our house or anything like that, so we can focus on understanding your heart and your love for us and your people. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so again, just welcome to our Saturday worship, and we're back into the book of Matthew. We just finished our One Kingdom series. If you missed that, go to our um, website uh, at www.cbc.net, or you can go to our YouTube channel at CBCSF. You can actually watch those again. Um, I'm going to try to put a playlist on there so you can watch those. Um, And it's just so important because there's so much... Um, content in those sermons that, you know, if we're going to continue to to grow and dig deeper into God's word and who he is. And so we're going to continue kind of that theme of unity, that theme of us and God ruling together. And the idea that God's kingdom is living in us and being brought to this world through us. So we're going to kind of continue on that, even though our series is over. Um, but we're going to go back into the book of Matthew And today, the sermon is called, Wait For It. And I don't know about you, but I am waiting for the time that we reopen our church. I'm waiting for the time that I can go back and see my friends in person and, you know, and the the people that I work with and minister to and all this stuff and to be able to play basketball again, like in the gym that we have and, you know, just all these things, going back to restaurants and eating my favorite food and traveling and, you know, all these things you know, I'm I'm waiting in anticipation, and I'm sure you are too, and we all are. And we're waiting for this vaccine. We're waiting for, um, really, for God to move. That's what we're really waiting for. And so today, we're going to look into the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Um, my main point today is that God continues to surprise us with his love. And that is a truth that he proves to us over and over and over again, because remember, it's not just a feeling or something that's manufactured from us. He is love. That is the definition of who God is. And so when he shows up, when we see him, when we experience him, when we pray and ask him to show himself, he shows us his love. And when we wait for it, we're waiting for him to come and save us. Right? We're waiting for him to move. And sometimes when he doesn't move, we're waiting patiently. We know that he's going to love us. We know that he's going to come. Um, but we're going to go into this chapter uh, 27. We're going to take a look a little bit more about how God works and how he shows us his love and how he surprises us. Um, before we go into that, you know, like I was saying a couple weeks ago, Um, that nowadays in shelter in place, we can't go out or do too much except for groceries and, you know, essential work and things like that. So the other best thing is to, you know, be online. And the greatest thing is social media and you have Netflix and Disney Plus and you get to kind of watch these shows. And so lately just definitely been watching, you know, more movies and more deep shows. But God has been speaking through them all. And I think the reason for that is because there's this, thing about stories it is so relatable we see characters in these shows and these movies and we get to see something that god has put in our hearts this longing for something better and so in real life right god is the reality that we long for and so you know i want to share with you a movie that i just recently saw they just do such a great job in building suspense in the classic movie of back to the future And I love it. It's definitely one of my favorite movies. I love, you know, the idea of time and space. Um, And even though we know that the hero is going to, you know, save the day, right? Marty is the main hero and he's the one traveling through time. You know, we can relate to this possibility that, you know, things don't work out. But it feels so good when things do work out, right? Just a little background on the movie if you haven't seen it before. Right, Back to the Future, there's three parts to it. But the first one, you know, we learn about this kid, his name's Marty, and he gets sent back in time by accident in a time machine. So the whole movie is pretty much just him trying to get back to the future, right, back to his time. And it sounds so easy, right, because he has his time machine, he needs to go back. But no, it's actually not that easy. The entire movie is about these obstacles that come in, t- in his way to 
to kind of thwart his going back, right? So different things happen. Um, for example, his parents, you know, something happened and they, they weren't getting together. And so because they weren't getting together, he was going to cease to exist, right? Um, at the end of near the movie, they were trying to, you know, get the power to go for this time machine, but they couldn't get the power because at that time, that technology wasn't available yet. And so they had to wait for a lightning to come, a night, lightning bolt. And so when they had that lightning bolt, they had this cable, and at the last second when the the lightning was about to strike, you know, the cable snaps, then the car doesn't start again. And like, there's just, just all these things. And my point is, you know, in this movie, right, in our life, sometimes there's just all these things that can just go wrong. And it seems like it just gets worse and worse and worse. And each obstacle makes it more and more impossible to see hope, right? Impossible for Marty to get back into time. But eventually, right at the last second, we see that is able to go back to the future. We see that everything works out. And actually, if you look at the movie again, things actually get better than it was before. And so I don't know about you, but I'm definitely waiting in anticipation, you know, for this vaccine. Um, but it seems that, you know, this, this quote here, that things will get worse before it gets better. You know, we're hearing that a lot, a lot more often. Um, and one of the couple things that I've kind of noticed this past couple months, right, is that things are getting worse and it's going to get worse before it gets better. According to California Restaurant Association, an estimated 30,000 restaurants in California out of 90,000, that's 30 percent, in California might shut down for good, right? There's 2,000 businesses just in the Bay Area alone that are closed for good, right? Um, a private school up in Napa called St. John, a Catholic school, just recently closed after 108 years due to declining students' um, enrollment and this whole pandemic. And that one really hits close to home because for our church, we have a huge ministry at our school. And just talking with, you know, some of you guys who work there and, and things like that, that is definitely something that's very scary is this possibility of, you know, not having a school you know, for the future. And, and I don't know what's happening. I'm not saying that it is or not, but these things are reality, right? Things are going to get worse before it gets better. But what does that mean for us as believers? What does that mean for us as Christians? And this phrase, right? I think it's to give hope, right? It's to give hope in the midst of a terrible situation. Um, it's to help us cope with this reality that things are really bad and that they are going to get worse. But there's hope in it because it's also a reminder that even though it goes bad, it's not going to last. It is going to get better. From the Bible, you know, we learn that God's people were enslaved, right, by the Egyptians, but he freed them, right? Even though they were exiled from their home, God brought them back, right? And that was in the span of like 70 years. Jesus calms the storm. The blind were able to see, the deaf were able to hear, and the dead will rise again. And so it gets worse before it gets better. Oh, yeah. I think the Bible shows a lot of that. And there's this pattern there, right? Things really do get worse before it gets better. Um, and the whole point is, wait for it. And if you notice, God is the one who makes it better. He is the one who freed the Israelites from the Egyptians. He's the one who who heals. He's the one who brought Jesus back to life. He is the one who saves us. He is the one who gives us hope, right? When things around us are crumbling, right, there seems to be no hope. But the question we should really be asking is, what is God doing? Not necessarily where is God and why is all this stuff happening, but it's asking God, well, what are you doing? Because if we're here waiting for it, we're, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for God. We have hope, we have faith that he is going to move because he has proved himself for years and years and centuries and centuries that even though things are bad, even when they get worse, they will get better. So what is God doing? Um, you know, like a parent, even though I'm not a parent, you know, I work with a lot of kids, um, we can't always be there 
to make sure our children are doing every single thing right, right? We can't be watching them 24-7. You know, we can't be sitting in their room while they're sleeping just to make sure that they, don't, you know, don't, don't choke on something, right? We do have to kind of let them do their thing. And a lot of times, like parent, right, sometimes we have to let them fail a bit and let them figure out a better way. And I think God does something similar for us. And I think out of pure love, God steps away and watches us from distance, right? He lets sin do its thing. And what sins does is it slowly causes death and to decay and decay because that's what happens when you have sin. So things get worse, right? But when the timing is right, he steps in and with his might and sovereign power, he shows us that he is God and he makes things better so that we can see that we need him. So that we can see who he really is. That we can see that he truly does love us. And so do you feel like God doesn't care? And you know, I want you to reflect on that right now. And the challenges and the hardships that you're facing right now. Um, you know, it's been four months since the pandemic. I'm sure there are a lot of different challenges now. And, you know, maybe we're really feeling it, right? In our wallets or bank accounts. And, you know, we're thinking for the next year. And, you know, we really thought that we could probably go back you know, a couple months ago, but now it seems like we're going to be stuck here for at least the next year or so, right? Things are just getting worse and worse, but wait for it. It's going to get better. And so he knows everything that's happening, including things that we hide from God, right? God knows everything, everything behind closed doors. He is the one who says when and how the world is going to be destroyed, Right. We have to believe that he's in full control. Right. He's building anticipation so that we can feel what it is like without him and then deeply understand his unconditional love. That's how God does it. That's why these movies and these shows and these things, you know, we can really relate to because we experience this anticipation. Right. Um, of what's to come. And so, you know, the things may seem bad now, but hold on to your faith during any storm, wait for it, because God is going to make it better. So let's dive in and take a look in the book of Matthew, chapter 27. We're going to go verse 27 to 66. It's a lot. We're going to break it up in a couple of chunks here, but something I want you to see, something that Matthew actually wants us to see throughout this whole book, is that he wants to remind us and convince his readers, his hearers, that Jesus really is the Son of God. And so like all great storytellers, they, they build up anticipation, right? Like I said, you know, in Back to the Future, it's the whole movie. It's about anticipation and just building this up um, to a point where things are going to get better. And so Matthew 27, 27 to 66 really talks about how Jesus is going to the cross to die for our sins. But there's this anticipation, just a lot of details um, leading up to his death on the cross and even leading up his resurrection. So we're going to take a look at that um, and really kind of look at how we need to wait for God and believe that he is going to make things better. So let's take a look here, Matthew 27, verse 27. We're going to go to 27 to 44 in this section here. It says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And so if you're following along, keep these items in mind. Scarlet robe on him. And then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Serene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to to drink it. And just really quick there, gall is something that is very bitter. Um, it was said that it was used as a sedative for these criminals that were being 
crucified because they wanted to take away the pain. And so when Jesus tasted this, you know, he was like, no, I, I don't want to sedate this pain. He was going to take the full brunt of this crucifixion. That's really important to remember. So he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. I'm going to pause there real quick, and I, and I want you to see all these little things that's being said here and this picture that's being shown. There's all these things that's happening to build up anticipation to who Jesus really is, not just a man who is here being crucified and saying blasphemous things that he is the son of God, but that he truly is the son of God. And so we have three points today to just remind us, you know, what are we waiting for, right? Um, we're waiting for God to, to, to come and, and show us who he is. And so the first point here is that God cannot be mocked. This whole section here is about these soldiers and chief priests and people mocking Jesus, right? How are they mocking him? They're mocking him with like different things that's happening, right? So in Galatians 6, 7 to 8, I just kind of want to bring this up because this is what the Bible tells us. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. And so here we see that Jesus is, he's reaping from the spirit, right? He is giving up his life so that we can have eternal life. But there are people here who are reaping things that they are sowing, right? Um, they're sowing to please their flesh, right? We're, they're doing things that reap destruction. And so Matthew is setting up Jesus for the greatest comeback story in history, right? Jesus sows eternal life in every one of these little things. And let's just break it down real quick, right? I said we were, we're going to, you know, think about these items and these things. The first one was the scarlet robe, right? Scarlet robe, scarlet meaning red, right? We know that his blood, Jesus's blood is what cleanses our sins. And this scarlet robe is an anticipation to what is really going to happen is when Jesus sheds his blood for us, he cleanses us, we're actually robed in righteousness. And it's said in the Bible, described as a white robe. And so for those of us who believe, we're going to be clothed with Jesus' righteousness. We're going to be clothed with this white robe that signifies that we belong to God. And so that's here, just anticipation of what this robe is. And they're mocking him, but really we're going to get an actual you know, um, we're not going to get an actual robe, right? Crown of thorns, crown of thorns. It reminds us that Jesus is going to be the king of kings, even though this crown of thorns is made out of thorns, but he's really going to have an everlasting kingdom. He's going to have a real crown that actually gives him the authority to rule over everything, which brings me to the next one is the staff in the right hand. Right? They're making fun of Jesus because they're saying like, oh, he is so great and he's going to be that who, the one who rules over us. Well, let's make fun of him. But Jesus really is the true ruler. Right, He is the ultimate shepherd. He is the true head of the church. Right, He is going to rule over all things. Right, And you see these soldiers, they knelt before him and they mocked him. They threw insults at him. But at the end of all this, when God comes back and when God saves the day, all nations, tongue, and tribe will kneel. 
But instead of hurling insults, they can be using their mouths to praise and worship Jesus. And that's partly why we sing songs when we praise. And I know it's sometimes a little difficult when we're online and it's nice to just like sit and hear, you know, the beautiful voices of our worship leaders, you know, but one thing I want to encourage you to actually sing out loud at home. And that's the best part because, you know, if you're afraid of people hearing you, um, then you can sing all all you want because you're at home (laughs) and maybe there's nobody around you except maybe your family members, but you can sing, you can sing from your heart. You can sing out of your mouth. You can worship. That's who we are and who we're supposed to be. And so there's this, there's this spiritual um, thing that happens when we sing and, and say truths about who God is and praises and worship. And so these soldiers who are kneeling before Jesus and mocking him, right? What they don't know is that one day, all God's people will be kneeling before the Lord. All God's people will be shouting and singing at the top of their lungs, great is the Lord, holy, holy, holy. All right, it's going to be beautiful. Um, they spat and hit Jesus with his own staff, right? Those who do not put their faith in Jesus, they're going to suffer the fate of scorn and pain in hell in a place that is separated from God forever. So even though they are making... Um, they're hurting Jesus, they're going to be hurt for the long, the long run. Right. Um, something interesting here too, Simon from Serene was forced to carry the cross for Jesus. And there's just one sentence that Matthew brings up here. In other parts of the Bible, you know, that we have the whole story, a, a little more detail about who this Simon is. But I think that Matthew put this in here because he's trying to remind us, right, this anticipation of who God is, is that we are part of of the story as believers we are also in this anticipation we are also part of the suffering we are also part of what jesus is going through and so simon of cyrene was forced to carry the cross for jesus that's us we get to be part of this greatest comeback but it's also through our suffering as well We're not exempt from all the stuff that's happening in this world, right? We are also suffering together, except the difference is we know who our Lord is. We know where faith is. We know where a hope comes from, right? And so that's really important for us to remember. And eventually we know that the hero of the story, Jesus, he does save himself, right? Even though these guys were saying like, why don't you show yourself to us? Why don't you save yourself since you saved so many people? Well, the fact that The fact is, he will, and he does. He's going to do that for eternity. And so it's just really satisfying to me that these guys, you know, are going to get what they deserve and what's coming to them, right? There's this kind of satisfaction that's like, wow, little do they know this guy truly is the son of God. So you kind of see how um, how this anticipation works here. And so God cannot be mocked, right? We can say all these things, but God is who he is. And he will continue to be who he is. Jesus is the son of God. And it doesn't matter who who mocks him or doesn't believe him or doubts. He still is the son of God. He still is our savior. He still is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He still is the one who saves us all. And so that's why we wait for it. We wait for Jesus. We wait for God's timing. But we know that he is going to come and he is going to make things better and so, you know, Jesus is kind of like the, the underdog that rises up to the top, to his rightful place, like Vanellope from Wreck-It Ralph. Watch that movie. God cannot be mocked, right? We cannot mock him. But sometimes, you know what? We are like these soldiers. Sometimes we're like the chief priest. Sometimes we mock God without even knowing it, right? And you're like, wow, how, how do I do that? Me? I, I mock God? No, I believe in God. Well, we mock him when we doubt, Because when we doubt, we're saying that God isn't going to come through, right? We're saying that we don't trust him, right? When we doubt, when we don't live out our faith, we mock God without even knowing it. Because we're saying, God, you are not enough for me. I don't believe that you're going to X, Y, Z. You can fill in the blanks, right? When we don't act like Jesus is our life source, our savior, We're mocking him just like how these soldiers are, right? Maybe not to the extent where it's so, you know, um, open, but in our attitudes, 
in our hearts we're doing the things that these people are doing because they don't truly believe that he's the son of God. And so without even verbally saying it, you know, we show that his power is not enough for us. Right. So let's be careful about our attitudes, you know, our intent, our actions. Does it really reflect who God is? Is he only God and we really need help? And I believe he's who he is all the time. So he cannot be mocked. He is our Lord, our Savior, our conqueror, our shepherd, our leader, our life source. So wait for it. Because God cannot be mocked. He is who he is. And he's going to show himself to us. And so that goes to the um, next point. But first, we're going to end this in Matthew 27. This part, this first point, I mean, 45 to 49. And it says from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, leme septani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of these standing there, some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine and vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. So again, this anticipation, right? Wait for it, right? Elijah is going to do more. Elijah is going to do more than just save Jesus, right? He's going to do so much more. And we're going to see what that looks like. So my point number two you know, God cannot be mocked. But number two is God's power will be displayed. So when you say the worst, you know, worse is coming, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. This is where we're in preparation and anticipation to see how God works. Remember that first question I was posing is the question to ask is what is God doing? He is showing us his power. Right. And maybe right now he's not showing it yet. But he wants to he wants you to see what it is like without him. Right? God's power will be displayed. Matthew 27, this is verse 50 to 54. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Some more things here. This curtain, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. Wait for it. The bodies of many holy people who died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. And so God's power will be displayed, right? The temple curtain, this was a heavy curtain. And the reason for this curtain is in the temple, it separated the people, the priests, from this inner room where God's spirit dwells. And so nobody except for the priests could go in there. Um, and it was a place where it was kept holy, right? And it was something where, um, you know, people understood that that's where God's spirit was. And you don't mess with God. But when this curtain split, it signified that God's spirit is now everywhere. And through Jesus, he tells us that, well, once he goes back to heaven, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. The spirit, God's spirit now lives in each believer. So think about that. Let that sink in a little more. God's spirit that was in this inner room all the way in Jerusalem across the world here, that spirit, that power lives inside your heart, inside of you. That's crazy. That's the power being displayed when we allow God's spirit to work through us and in us, right? This temple curtain, God's spirit now lives inside us, right? This earthquake, even the earth, responded in worship, right? This earth we know is not just something that just 
happens, right? Earthquakes that just happen randomly. I know there was just an earthquake in LA, right? These things were just like, oh, it's just kind of by chance or things just happen. But let's not forget that this is all part of God's power, right? It's not just us. He is in control of this earth and this world. That's huge. You know, the dead are now alive. You know, this is what happens. Um, I was just thinking, like, who cares about the next president? Dead people are coming to life. That should be huge, right? Um, a response to God's power. You know, look at the centurion and their response, right? They're non-believers. These are probably, you know, some of the soldiers that were part of mocking Jesus. But now that they've seen all this stuff happening, look at what they say. They acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. So as we're waiting for it, as we're experiencing the worse before it gets better, let's hold on to the faith and know that this is all part of God's plan. His power is going to be displayed. And like my main point too, is that God is going to surprise us. He continues to surprise us with his love. And so sometimes we put God in this box, right? We're like, oh man, like what, what's, what is God going to do next? Like, I, I don't know. Well, let's have more faith because if God is the one who can bring the dead back to life, you know, that's the God who can do a lot of crazy, cool things in this world. But do we have faith as we're waiting? Waiting in anticipation because we know that God's power will be displayed. And so my last point here is that God's love cannot be stopped. And that gives me so much comfort because even though things are happening, there's this relationship that we have with God. And so let's finish this up. Matthew 27, verse 55 to 66. And it says, Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary was sitting there opposite the tomb. And so just a quick pause here. Even though Jesus was dead at this time, you know, his love was still alive in his disciples, right? You're going to love this. Many women, because most of the guys ran away, except probably John, who Jesus was saying, John, take care of my mom. This is one guy. And then this other guy, this rich man from Arimathea, Joseph, and notice that this is a rich man. Remember the story of the rich man? This is another rich man who is actually a follower of Jesus, right? And his love for Jesus compelled him to take care of his body. Does that sound familiar, taking care of the body? You know, God's love cannot be stopped. Even though right now, even in this moment, that Jesus, the man, is dead, his love, the power of God's love is still there. That should tell you something really powerful about God's love. So let's be like these people, these women, right? And John and Joseph, let's care for people's needs because God's love cannot be stopped. Let's have faith that God is going to use us to give hope to people who right now is maybe experiencing maybe the worst thing in their life. But let's remind them of how good God is. And so let's continue here. The next day, the one after preparation day, this is verse 62. The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. 
And so if you remember from our last sermon about Pilate, here we see Pilate as being a pushover again. Um, this guy, right? Still wants no responsibility, yet is still part of it all, right? Chief priests called Jesus that deceiver, right? They really believe that Jesus is a liar. And they actually are trying to go the extra mile to even make sure that the disciples don't perpetuate this quote unquote lie, right? And so that should really tell us something, right? That God's love still continues. And these people don't have God's love, right? But yet, spoiler alert, right? It doesn't matter what they do to try to stop Jesus from raising from the dead, right? God's love for his people cannot be stopped. And if you truly believe how much God loves you, you know, wait for it. He's going to do and show you so many things that you can't even imagine, right? That love, it's so great that when you see it, when you realize it, you can't unsee it, you can't deny it. And that's the thing that I you know, want to encourage you all now is to continue to, to realize that God is who he is. There's nothing that anybody can do that can stop God from showing his power. There's nothing that we can do to stop God from loving us and loving his people. I don't know about you, but that gives me so much comfort, so much comfort. We have to believe. And when we believe then we can know, know the things of God. When we know the things of God, we can see. And we can see that things are going to get better, right? God continues to surprise us with his love. So wait for it. And seriously, you know, wait, wait for next week because we are going to continue to see how Jesus surprises his people. And I hope that this gives you an encouragement that even though these challenges are coming, even though it seems like there's a dead end, even though it seems like there's no hope, there is hope. Maybe it's not something that we expect. Maybe it's, you know, not something that we think will happen. But guess what? God knows. And he's the one who's going to show his power in a way that we can't even understand because our minds are just so finite. But God is infinite. And his love is so big and so grand that we can't even explain it. But when we know it, when we believe it, when we see it, we can't deny it that God is good, that he is there. And so I hope that you continue to see God and that you get to experience his surprises, his love for us, even though we're in this pandemic. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we just thank you that you are so active in loving us, so active in showing us who you are. And Lord, you stop at nothing. You continue over and over and over again to show us that you're the one who saves us, that you are the one who gives us life, that you're the one who allows us to have a relationship with you, that allows us to have all the good things that we experience here on earth and even more when we're with you in heaven. Lord, I pray that this hope that we have isn't just this feeling that we get from knowing who you are, but that it comes from us living out our faith living out who you are in our life. Lord, your power lives inside of us and you allow us to rule this world with you, to bring about goodness and love and peace and joy to everybody and everything around us. Lord, I pray that you will give us opportunities to continue to show your power to people. Lord, even though we're, we're waiting and maybe nothing's happening, Lord, we know that you are still there. Remind us that we can still trust in you. Remind us that you are still there. And we know that you're going to continue to do amazing things because you love us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail me yet That you never fail me yet And I never will forget That you never fail me yet and I never will forget Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to believe that you're the one who's going to do it again. You're the one who's going to continue showing us that you are God, that you are love, that you're not going to stand around allowing us to be tortured and allowing us to, to live in sin. But Lord, you give us hope. And yes, even though things are going to get worse, we know that it's going to get better. And so Lord, we wait on you humbly, patiently, knowing that you are God, knowing that you are going to do what you do. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you for joining us again on Wednesday nights. If you want to pray with us and you know have something to, to pray for, there's a lot to pray for, um, come join me online on Zoom from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. The link is on Facebook or cbc.net. Hopefully we'll see you there. Um, also, we're not going to have our usual kind of hangout after worship. And so I want to encourage you to just be with your families, you know, take some time maybe now before you even go to dinner and just spend some time in prayer and spend some time reflecting on, you know, the things that, you know, God has spoken to you tonight. And it's just so important to, to put, you know, what our mind is thinking with what our heart is doing and what our hands are going to be doing. And so really just take this time to reflect back and we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us.